Thank you, Hannah. Friends, let's pray as we open up God's Word together. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence and we open up your Word, and we ask that as we do that, that your Word would open us up. Open us up to hear what you have to say to us. Lord, during this time, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, friends, as Hannah said, we have arrived at the final week of our Love Illuminated series. Throughout the last several weeks, we have been walking through the book of 1 John, and we have been talking about so many different aspects of love. This letter, this epistle of John, shows many things. It shows how God's love is illuminated to us through Jesus Christ our Lord, and how the love of God is illuminated through us then to the world that Christ came to save. In recent weeks, we have talked about how Jesus has made God's love tangible to us. We've talked about how his love brings the sin in our lives into the light where it can be dealt with, it can be confessed and forgiven. We've talked about how our love often gets distorted when we direct it toward the wrong places or for the wrong reasons. We've talked about how we're called to demonstrate love to the world around us, and we've talked about the different kinds of love that we see in Scripture and in our lives. And so today, as we conclude this journey through 1 John, we are going to look at the fifth and the final chapter where John describes certain characteristics or birthmarks of God's love in our lives. It's appropriate for us to talk about these traits as birthmarks of God's love for a few different reasons. First of all, John associates these qualities with the experience of spiritual birth, of being born again by the Spirit of God. Our new life in Christ does not begin with us. It starts when God brings about this new and glorious spiritual birth within us, and everything else that happens comes as a result. Second, these marks show that we are part of God's family. Just as certain physical birthmarks can be hereditary, so these spiritual birthmarks set us apart. They reveal our resemblance to God and to one another. And just with physical birthmarks, we don't pick these things. They come from God. They're independent of our actions and our desires. And finally, these are things that we cannot conceal. We cannot hide them from the world. As the Mewlink ladies reminded us in that video a couple weeks ago, hide them under a bushel? No. Often we may go to great lengths to try to conceal physical birthmarks with varying degrees of success. But these spiritual birthmarks are things that we cannot and must not conceal. In fact, these birthmarks of God's love are themselves good news. They come with promise about who we are as God's children because of his great love for us. So if you haven't already, I invite you to turn or to scroll in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5 as we take a look at these birthmarks of love together. And this morning, we're going to look at five of these birthmarks that appear in 1 John chapter 5. And these are not the only birthmarks of being born again by God's love, but they're the ones that John wants to talk about as he concludes his letter. And so if they were important enough for John to focus on them, that's going to be our focus for today. The first one of these birthmarks of God's love in our lives that we see in this passage is love and obedience. Now, now you say, well, pause right here, Andrew. First of all, you said the birthmark of love is love. Doesn't that sound kind of circular? And yes, it does, but we're not talking about going in a circle. We're talking about how the birthmark of God's love for us is love then that we show toward God and others. And, and second, you say, well, Andrew, you, you said birthmark, but you mentioned two things. Are you trying to pull a pastor trick and sneak some extra things in on us? Well, no, these things go together. They're, in some ways, two sides of the same coin. And we see this in 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. John says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. 
In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. Now, these verses tell us three significant things about love and obedience. First, they tell us that loving and obeying do indeed go together. John includes these two actions in the same breath. This is how we know that we love God, by loving him and by carrying out his commands. And then he says that to love God is to keep his commands. Now, now this idea that there is no love without obedience and that there is no obedience without love, this is not something that John came up with on his own. This is something that he heard Jesus say multiple times during the three years that John spent with Jesus. We see this in John chapter 14, verse 15, when Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commands. And then we see the same idea if you just flip the numbers in that reference to John chapter 15, verse 14. Now, John didn't plan it this way, but it's kind of cool. The same kind of statement, you are my friends if you do what I command. And those are just two examples of this teaching that we see throughout John's writings that he received from Christ. So how do we know that love for God is real if it is backed up by our actions? And this is a process. This is a learning process for many of us. In fact, in my household right now, we have a lot of discussions about the topic of obedience. We have discovered, Mary and I, that our children are very talented at interpreting parental instructions as friendly suggestions (laughs) or optional advice or things that are good to know, but you don't have to do anything about. Funny, no one had to teach them to do that. However, we're spending a great deal of time and energy teaching them that being our child means to listen and to obey what we tell them. And the same is true for us being children of God. It means to listen and to obey. It's easy for us to chuckle about how we see this trend in the lives of children or other people, but we don't want to let ourselves off the hook here because we do the same thing with God. We're fine following Jesus when it doesn't cost us a whole lot. We're really good at interpreting his difficult teachings as interesting spiritual ideas and interpreting his rigorous commands for us as flexible guidelines that we'll take into consideration. But John reminds us that we cannot have just half of Jesus. We get all of him. We receive him as our friend and as our absolute authority figure that we must obey. And so if we struggle to obey him, John would invite us to search our hearts and to ask ourselves who it is that we truly love most, because when we love God, obeying his commands is not burdensome. Second, love for God means loving others. Love for God will lead to love from others. We can't love God without loving others. And this is not a new concept to us. We see it all over Scripture. We see how the great commands are to love the Lord our God with everything we've got, and to love our neighbor, to love others as ourselves. But in verse 2, John takes it a step further, and he tells us that the reverse of that is true as well, that loving and obeying God are also evidence that we love God's children. So third, love for others means loving and obeying God too. And this is very typical John. As you've noticed, John loves to talk in circles. He likes to make one statement equivalent to another and bring everything back around. And here he does exactly that. He says, you can't love God without loving other people, and you can't love other people without loving God. It's part of the same package. So let's pause and let's consider the implications of what John is telling us. That if we really, really want to love other people well— If you truly want to offer your very best as a friend, as a parent, as a grandparent, as a mentor, as a teacher, as anyone in relationship with other people, if you truly want to thrive in relationship, then love God. If you truly want to see the people that you cherish the most in your life thrive and flourish, 
then pursue God because that will have an overflow effect on those relationships. Without putting God first in your life, without God at the top, there will always be something missing from these other relationships. And you'll only be at the top of your game as a husband, as a wife, as a boyfriend, as a girlfriend, as a friend, as a brother, as a sister, as anyone in relationship when God is first in your life. So the results of this birth are an overflow effect of love. This first birthmark of being born again as a child of God is to love and to obey. And the promise and the blessing of this birthmark is that if you are someone who has been born of God, then love will flow forth from you in a way that impacts the lives of others, in a way that bears witness to the amazing reality of who God is and what God is doing in the world. That's the first spiritual birthmark of God's love that we see in this passage. The second birthmark that comes with being a child of God that John talks about here is victory. And we see this discussed in verses 4 and 5. John tells us, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. And this word even in Greek really means especially. It's there for emphasis. Our faith is the victory. Verse 5, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, in the original Greek, John uses the word for victory and variations of it four different times in these two verses. And this Greek word is nike, from which we receive the brand name Nike, Nike, N-I-K-E. Now, I know that the brand Nike has gone through its share of controversy recently, but the fact remains that they chose a really good name for their brand. Because when you lace up a pair of Nikes before the big game, you are literally strapping victory to your feet. And so, because of that, I suspect that if, if somehow the Apostle John were to be transported through time to the 21st century and we were taking him into store so he could buy some clothes and blend in, he would be drawn to this brand that he would say as Nike, and he would probably leave Coles wearing the word Nike all over his body. Because Nike Victory is such an important part of John's writings. We see it all over things that, we, that he has written. We see this idea of Nike when John quotes the words of Jesus in John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus says, I have told you these things that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome. I have Nike'd the world. Jesus tells us this knowing that we're going to live in a world that fills us with distress. But he says, I have overcome the world. Nenikeka tan kosmon. I have Nike'd the world. I have defeated the world. I have won decisive victory over the world. And as John communicates to us, all who have faith in Jesus Christ have defeated the world as well. John's other famous writing, the book of Revelation, also is saturated with language of Nikkei. In the opening section that contains letters to the different churches, there is a promise for all who Nikkei, for all who Nike, for all who overcome. And then in Revelation chapter 12, John tells us of this amazing vision of the church of God, which has been battered and beleaguered by the onslaught of the powers of darkness, nevertheless rejoicing in their victory over the devil and his forces. Revelation 12, verses 10 through 12 say, Then I, this is John in a vision, heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power, and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser, Hadiabolos, the devil, for that's what the devil is. He is an accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They, the church of God, have triumphed 
They have Nike'd over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death, just as the Christian martyrs that Pastor Aaron reminded us today, they were willing to pay the ultimate price for their faith. Verse 12, therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. So this is a lot of Nike talk from John. What do we learn about this birthmark of victory from John's writings? Well, first, that you are a victor regardless of your circumstances. In fact, as Jesus tells us, we should expect dire circumstances, and that is even proof that you are a victor because Christ has overcome the world. So we should expect trouble in this life. We should anticipate the things will be difficult. Note that the saints referred to in Revelation 12 faced relentless attack from the devil and from his forces. The devil accused them before God by day and by night, and so our enemy seeks to undermine our confidence through adversity and through accusation. The devil will do anything he can to distort our sense of reality, to cause us to abandon our hope, to undermine our confidence, and to get us to give up. We will not always feel victorious. In fact, much of the time we will feel like we are being defeated. But our victory in Jesus Christ has very little to do with how we feel. It has everything to do with what Jesus has done for us. And second, we see that God's definition of victory is very different from the world's definition. Revelation 12, 11 indicates that the victorious people of God are the ones who did not value their earthly lives to the point of shrinking away from death. The message is that those who are victorious are those who were slain for Christ. From the world's point of view, death and martyrdom do not look like victory. But in God's upside-down kingdom, that is the victory. The victory is staying true. The victory is staying pure. The victory is clinging to the gospel. Being victorious does not mean being powerful or feeling like you are on top. Instead, those who remain faithful to Christ to the point of death achieve a victory that the world can never understand and can never take away because of God's great love for us. Friends, so often the world convinces us to try to use its definition of victory in our lives. And we face that temptation all around us. We face that temptation right now. Even this week, we are going to face this pressure to evaluate our success and our victory as the people of God based on whether things seem to be going our way. This week, the devil wants us to place our hope in what happens on Tuesday in our country. This week, the devil wants us to believe that the cause of Christ and the vitality of the Christian church depend upon who wins and who loses, on who rises to power and on who falls. But John would remind us that the kingdom of God does not rise or fall with the fortunes of earthly nations or political parties. Even, even if this nation that we love were to crumble into the void of history before our very eyes, even if the full might of Caesar were to be leveled against the Christian church as it was during the days of John, then we would in all things remain more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Because that is where our victory comes from. It does not matter what we see happening around us. We have nothing to fear. Let us not give away this hope and this birthright this week. Let us proclaim where our hope truly comes from. Why, friends? Because faith itself is evidence of God's victory in your life. No matter what may be happening in the world around you, John tells you that your faith is the victory through which you Nike the world. And so if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then you have a victory that the world cannot give 
and that the world cannot take away. You are already victorious. So victory is the second birthmark of God's children. And the promise that we find here is this. Children of God, your victory is already won in the person and work of Jesus Christ. There's m- nothing more you need to do to achieve it. So live fearlessly as a victor in Jesus Christ. Yesterday happened to be one of my favorite holidays of the year, Reformation Day. <laughs> yes, for those of you who uh, keep track of this along with me, you know that yesterday marked 503 years since uh, Martin Luther unintentionally launched the movement that we refer to today as the Protestant Reformation. And so if at some point yesterday you heard a a knock or a pounding on your door and you went to your door to find not trick-or-treaters but that someone had nailed a theological document to your door, I will neither confirm nor deny my involvement. (laughs) But in all seriousness, Martin Luther during his life and during his ministry, he left us with a marvelous testimony to our Christian hope and victory. His hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, articulates a theology of victory that is second to none in the history of sacred music. And in, in these words, Luther gets it. He says this, he says, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear. For God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure. For lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. The living word, Jesus Christ. Luther goes on to say, that word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. So let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Children of God, yours is the victory in Christ. The third birthmark of a child of God that John describes in this passage is faith. We think, wow, that's an original idea, John. But what is striking is that faith he presents as the result, the birthmark of this new birth. This birth comes and results in our faith and our trust in Jesus, our Lord and Savior. In the verses that follow, John describes faith in Jesus as our response to the testimony that we receive about him. He says, starting in verse 6, This is the one, Jesus is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. We'll talk about what that means in a moment. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. We, uh, for there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. So John says in Scripture we find God's testimony about who his Son is. John describes this testimony in terms of three witnesses. Now, in traditional Jewish culture, you would need two witnesses to make a legal case. John says, hey, we've got one better. We've got three. And so the three are the water, the blood, and the Spirit. The Spirit, of course, refers to the fact that the Holy Spirit is the catalyst for our spiritual birth. He regenerates our hearts, and He draws us to faith in Christ. The other two witnesses, the water and the blood, most likely refer in this case to the opening and closing events of Jesus' earthly ministry, his baptism with water in the Jordan River, and his crucifixion when his blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. But why does John pick these two moments as the witnesses in the testimony? He is, in all likelihood, responding to, to the Gnostic false teachers of his day. Pastor Aaron has talked about the Gnostic teachers in some of his other sermons, and this is one of the things that John was responding to in this letter. The Gnostics were teaching that Jesus was not truly human, 
And one particular Gnostic teacher, a fellow by the name of Serenthus, was teaching that Jesus was just a man who for a time was inhabited by a supernatural divine presence. And this divine presence was completely separate from the man Jesus, this divine Christ presence, descended upon him when he was baptized, but then left him and went back up to heaven before he was crucified. And, and so this is, this is the Gnostic escape hatch here. The Gnostics cannot stand the idea that God would actually become man and would actually be real flesh and blood and would actually die. So they come up with this sophisticated explanation that the human Jesus was flesh and blood, but this divine Christ this Christ presence was back in heaven when all of that stuff happened on the cross. And in response to all of this sophisticated theological quackery, John says, nope, this same Jesus who was born as a baby in Bethlehem was fully God and fully human from the moment of his conception to the moment of his baptism in the Jordan, to his death on the cross, to his resurrection from the dead, to his ascension to the Father's right hand, and will continue to be fully God and fully man forevermore. Because the incarnation is not merely an illusion or a temporary arrangement of convenience. The incarnation is the gospel. We have no gospel without a Savior who is truly God and truly man. Jesus Christ became human so that human sinners could be reconciled to God through the God-man. And our response to this gospel verifies our status as members of God's family. With this in mind, John continues in verses 10 through 12 to say, Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar, because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony, gospel summary coming right here. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. So faith, faith in this testimony is the, first, the third birthmark of this new birth. The promise for all who believe is this, children of God, because you have the Son, you have life. It is because of this new life that we receive the fourth birthmark that John mentions in this passage, which is confidence before God. This confidence expresses itself in two different ways. First is assurance of our salvation. We don't have to wonder if God really loves us. We don't have to wonder if we will really go to heaven. We don't have to wonder if we truly have a place in God's family. Because if you believe in Jesus, the answer to all of these questions is a resounding yes and amen. Going back to Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation, this topic was actually one of the battleground doctrines that separated Catholics and Protestants. It's not one that we talk about a lot when we discuss the Reformation, but the medieval Catholic church leaders were saying and thinking at the time that Christians can't really know for sure if we're saved. In fact, many of these Catholic teachers were saying it would be harmful if Christians thought that for sure they were saved because then they might go on sinning. They would be so confident in their salvation that they would lose sight of how they are to live and they would do all sorts of things. And so, no, 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 we need to keep them always wondering always second-guessing, always waiting, always coming back with penitence, asking for forgiveness. And while a certain aspect of that fear might be well understood, Martin Luther's response to that was, no, 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 you've got it all backwards. We don't obey Jesus out of fear. We obey him out of love. And this goes back to everything John has been saying in this book, to how love and obedience go together. Because good works do not lead to salvation. Instead, salvation leads to good works. And because our salvation does not depend on what we do, but upon what Jesus has done for us, it stands on a sure, unshakable foundation. It's because of that foundation that, G that John says this 
in verse 13. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. John wants us to have this assurance. He wants us to have this confidence before God. This confidence is part of our birthmark and birthright as God's children. So first, we can be confident. We can know for sure that we are saved, that we are forgiven, that we have eternal life. And second, we can confidently approach God in prayer. Verses 14 through 15, this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, and that phrase, according to his will, is important, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. This tells us, friends, that God listens to his children. And just as he is shaping our hearts so that our prayers will more and more align with his own heart, so also he is shaping the world around us to align with our kingdom-focused prayers. This confidence also overflows into our prayers for one another. John addresses the topic of praying for our brothers and sisters in the faith who are struggling with sin in the next verse. 16, if you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should pray about that. He's saying that is outside the scope of what we're talking about because that's not the kind of sin that you find in the community of faith. What a beautiful thing John is saying that, that God uses our prayers for one another to be part of his process of healing and restoring other believers when we stumble and fall. Because we know, we know that our brothers and sisters have the same unshakable hope of eternal life that we do. And because we know this, we can pray for them boldly and fearlessly, knowing that no matter how severe their struggles may be for a time, that God will not give up his hold on them. And he will not allow their sin to lead to their spiritual demise. He will have the victory in their lives. And he gives us the privilege of helping to pray that victory into effect. What a wonderful privilege that is. So confidence is the fourth birthmark of God's children. So children of God, his promise to you is this. Your place in his family is secure because it doesn't depend on the strength of your faith but on the power of your faithful Savior. You are God's child, and your Father listens to you. So far, John has described the birthmarks of love and obedience, of victory, of faith and confidence. And in the final verses, he describes one more birthmark of God's children, freedom from the power of sin. Now, as Americans, we love to talk about freedom. And we get excited when we hear the Bible talk about freedom we do well to pause and to make sure that we are looking, through our, looking at our culture through a biblical framework instead of looking at the Bible through our cultural framework. Because in our culture, we, we tend to think of freedom as an absence of boundaries. We think, well, I'm free when I can do whatever I want. Freedom means that no one can tell me what to do and no one can make me do something that I don't want to do. But that's different from the Bible's definition of freedom. Scripture doesn't think of freedom in terms of having no boundaries, but in terms of having the right boundaries. Biblical freedom isn't having no authority over you. It's having the right authority of, over you. Because if we have no authority over us, we become our own authority, and we make a pretty lousy authority for ourselves. And so, in the eyes of Scripture, Freedom focuses on being free from the old, bad master of sin so that we can serve the new, good master, the Lord. So with that in mind, John shows us three ways that children of God are now free from sin. First, children of God's sin will not lead to our spiritual demise. We saw this hinted at in verse 16, and we'll take another look at that along with verse 17, that if we see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. John says, I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death, i.e. the brothers and sisters in the faith. There is a sin that leads to death, 
I'm not saying you should pray about that because that's a sin that occurs outside the family of God. Verse 17, all wrongdoing is sin, and there is a sin that does not lead to death. But he doesn't define that. He doesn't talk about that here. But we see this and we say, hey, John, what are you referring to in this cryptic manner and not really getting into? And that's talked about in other parts of Scripture. The sin that leads to death is the act of rejecting Jesus as Lord and Savior. Elsewhere, Scripture refers to this as blasphemy against the Holy Spirit because, going back to what we saw earlier, it is the Spirit who applies the gospel to our hearts and leads us to receive Christ. So to blaspheme against the Spirit is to reject the Spirit's testimony about Jesus and therefore to remain dead in our sins. Therefore, by definition, those who are born again have already demonstrated that they've cleared this hurdle. You're no longer dead in your sins. You have the new life in Jesus Christ. And to use John's language of being born again, once you are born, the process is irreversible. You can't go back and unbirth yourself. Now your new life in Christ, uh, you, could, you could stunt that life. You could starve yourself spiritually. You could live as a rebellious child of God. But a child of God, you remain. Because the new birth is a one-way street. And great as your sins may be, they will not lead to your spiritual death. But we don't need to remain in those sins. The second aspect of this freedom from sin is that we can now break free from its power and dominance over our lives. Verses 18 through 20, John says, We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. That doesn't mean that they won't still commit sins, but they don't continue in this as a way of life. The one who is born of God keeps them safe. Jesus, the only begotten Son, guards over you. And the evil one, the devil, cannot harm them. Verse 19, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true By being in his son, Jesus Christ, he is the true God in eternal life. These verses speak of the new life that we are free to live in Christ. We will still commit acts of sin, but we will no longer remain in this rut of sin that characterizes life apart from God. Instead, we are set free to know Christ, to understand God, and to live differently. And third, embedded in these verses we just read is the promise that we are free from the devil's power. John declares in verse 18 that the evil one cannot harm us. That's kind of what Martin Luther was thinking when he wrote those words we saw earlier. Though this world apart from Christ still remains under the devil's dominion, we do not. We are outside of his jurisdiction. And we know that his death grip on the world itself will pass away when Jesus returns to finish making all things new. And so as Martin Luther reminded us, the prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. Jesus has already won the victory. Children of God, we are free. So where does this leave us? What is the conclusion of the matter for us? Well, we find an odd conclusion in verse 21. John closes this letter, this entire book, by saying simply, Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. At first glance, this seems like a really random and kind of abrupt way of ending this letter. Is this just an afterthought? Had John finished composing this letter, he was out on his way to the mailbox, and suddenly the thought struck him like a thunderbolt. Oh my goodness, I forgot to mention idols. Okay, open it up. P.S. Keep yourselves from idols. Okay, that was a close one. Now we can send this in the mail. You're entitled to your own interpretation. I think it's more likely that John didn't have an afterthought moment, but that he intended this as a summary of the entire letter that he had written. It's almost as if he's saying, Dear children, if you remember nothing else, remember this. Guard yourselves. Guard your hearts. Guard your minds. Don't be bamboozled by the idol of false teaching. Don't be distracted by the idol of love that gets twisted and perverted in pursuit of the wrong things. Don't get caught up loving the world. Don't be led astray. Don't forget who you are, children. Love and obey God. 
love one another because you are children of God. Remember that you have already overcome the world through your faith. Your faith is in Christ, the source of life. Because of your faith, live confidently before God and before one another, knowing that you are truly free. For as John proclaims, whoever has the Son has life. This life is ours because Jesus came by water and the blood. He came as one of us. He came to live a righteous life and to die in our place. And so it is through his death that we have life. To remind us of this, he commanded us to come together at this table to receive him and to focus once more on the promise. Friends, as John has reminded us today, if we have the Son, we have life. And so we remember that final meal that Jesus shared with John and with those other disciples. They did not understand what was about to happen to them. And they went through, during the time when Jesus was crucified, that full horror of seeing the power of the world rise up against them. They couldn't imagine how victory could come forth from that, but three days later, they saw Christ's victory. And they experienced that. And now that hope and that victory are ours, that to all who believe, Jesus invites us to receive him and to receive his body and to receive the cup of his salvation, the forgiveness that are ours because of what he did for us on the cross. And as we receive these things, remember, friends, that this table, the Lord's table, is open to all who believe, to all who place their hope in Christ, to all who say, yes, Lord, I turn from myself, I turn from all lesser things, and I place my hope in you. For in you alone is true life found. And so this table is for those who look to Christ. If you're not there yet, if you don't yet know Christ as your Savior, if you know him, but you're walking out of step with him right now, then I invite you, friends, to sit this one out. But to all who come to him, weak, poor, knowing that we bring nothing in our hands, that everything we have comes from him, that our very life and our very relationship with God the Father came through his blood shed for us, then this is the table for you. Let us pray as we prepare to partake together. Heavenly Father, we come in your presence and we give you thanks. We thank you for this table. We thank you for your son. We thank you for the life that you give to us. Lord, we ask as we gather at your table that you would bless this bread and that you would bless this cup. There is nothing innate or magical in them. They are the ordinary things of earth. But Lord, through them, we ask by your Spirit's power that they might become for us a means of grace and that as we gather here, you would nourish our faith you would strengthen our souls. Help us to feast upon your grace as it is offered to us in the gospel. Let us place our hope in your son, Jesus Christ, yet again. And fill us with your spirit's power so that we might rise and proclaim this good news to all. We pray in the mighty name of your son, Jesus. Amen.